We've got a, a, a number of special important announcements first. So uh, let me show you something. Beta. The hurricane season has been moving so fast this year. Just, just a few days ago, it was Sally. I mean, with like four days later, five days later, we're already in beta. Thankfully, these things haven't been that massive. Only been one so far that's hit that's really been massive. Sally was a, was a relatively minor 105 category that wiped out everything, including our Fort Walton fee site. So that's why we're in a little, little disarray over here trying to figure what to do. I began calling, I believe, I think the hurricane went through on Tuesday, so I began calling by Wednesday and couldn't get anyone. Finally, by Thursday morning, I got in touch with someone at an office away from Fort Walton. Fort Walton Beach was underwater, and our, our meeting room was in 16 inches of water. They can't get it ready in time. And, and like I said, that's just one of the many things they got going on right now. The beaches are messed up, they're washed away, some of the roads are out over there. Uh, because of the sand, woods everywhere, boats all over the place. So they just got a lot going on. So we're forced to look for another site. We haven't been successful. They spent two of their people online yesterday, almost five hours, seeing what else was available for us, and they hadn't found anything that would work for us, they said. So they're offering to get everybody the funds back to give everybody opportunity. Uh, Jeff and George Ann found two more possibilities, which we'll try to reach on Monday because nobody was answering the phone yesterday. So, so uh, everybody's in the same boat. They didn't even have power till Thursday in some of the areas on the, on the beach. So we're going to look again Monday. But here's the problem right now. We've got two weeks. Tentatively, the Florida site is down right now. If we can't find a place within the next couple of days to give everybody opportunity, to look for other arrangements, maybe go to Branson, uh, Myrtle Beach, uh, Fort Wall, I mean, Daytona Beach or whatever, uh, give everybody time or, or visit other sites if they needed to. Uh, we want to give everybody enough time. We will be holding the feast here if we can't get anything, but we need to make that decision within the next two days, Monday and Tuesday. So we'll let everybody here know. All the monies there have been, will be available immediately to us. I can give back to everybody who's, who's uh, paid for their rooms. We'll immediately go back to you. And then what we'll do today is just sit down and roughly game plan if you want to stay here or, or go to another site in Florida or over there or go continue in Branson or wherever you want to go. You know, each person needs to feel free to go wherever they need to go uh, for the feast. But that's our dilemma. There's many obstacles in a way. They can't, get, they can't get the room ready in two weeks, 16 inches. Even if they got it cleaned, uh, they still got to have inspections. And they, got, they, got, they said that's actually the meeting room was one of the last things on their agenda right now. They got to get their property back so they can start renting apartments over there. So anyway, that's what we're up against right now. Um, we did this once before, believe it or not. Our very first year when we got started with the church, <laughs> Ivan, same day, Last, in 16 years ago, and we held it here, and we had a great feast. We actually wound up with over 200 people coming and going during the course of the week. Had a lot of activities. It's a little different now. COVID's out there. So, this, so you know, as you can understand, there's a lot of obstacles that we're working on. But we're going to make it work, and we will be live streaming, God willing, unless something happens here. And that's why I put this up here. We have, we have given our word to everybody online who's been tuning in. And in the, in the people who've been watching the church and growing and the supporting us, we gave our word that we would help feed them during the feast because of COVID where they can't go anywhere, who's concerned with their health, their age, and finances. If we get over it, we can't, we can't live stream. We've got a bigger problem. We've got an audience of between 600 and 900 individual live streams a week right now who've been tuning in. If we don't live stream, we let everybody down that we said we're going to be there for them. So we've got to find a way to make it work for everybody. And that's what we're in the middle of right now. So we ask for your prayers that we can get it to work. And it will work. And God willing, it will work. And the reason I believe it will work is because of this. Believe it or not, here's what I'm looking at. See this beta that just comes in? Let me show you something. When it first started, this was its path. You see what's north of there? New Orleans. The path is of this morning, that's where it still was going. 
This is the fifth time this year. I had a call from a gentleman in Canada again yesterday. He says, here's my weekly call. He didn't say it again this time, but last week he called. He said, here's my weekly call to see how y'all doing with the new hurricane down there. Four times it originally started pointing at New Orleans, and every time God has diverted it. You know, you have to wonder, is Satan mad in trying to stop from us from doing our job? But this is the, now the new path. And just like the others, now it's going this way. There's going to be a hurricane. This is what happened with Sally. And they expected it to be a two, but then it just stayed out over water. Now look at the path that they're saying. Now they're talking about staying over water. Look where it's going. If you didn't see it yet, I wanted to bring that to your attention so y'all can pray again. So here it is. It's like it's coming and it gets diverted and like it's not going to, no, I'm going back to New Orleans. So it's heading back this way again. And the Sally went all the way over from us, all the way over into Pensacola. 200 miles, it was drifted off. And the people over there, the harbor masters in the boat saying, listen, this caught us all unaware. This was not supposed to happen. And then it picked up 25 mile an hour winds before it went in. So it pushed for hour after hour after hour, storm surge, third highest on record. Third highest on record in that area. We would have had close to a Katrina again. Who knows what would have happened if we'd had that much water coming to New Orleans again. I believe God's protecting us to be able to do what he needs to, for us to do, our job. That's what I believe. And because these things, every time they shoot, they, 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 they come after New Orleans, and then all of a sudden they're deterred, or they die out. So we're praying that God will do that again one more time. And we have gone from Sally to Beta in four days. This is the most they've had on record since 2005. So anyway, I wanted to bring that to your attention and to pray that, that God will bless us and, uh, and help us to get something either worked out here or the site over in Florida. But one way or the other, here's what I want everybody to know. I want you to go where you're comfortable and you can enjoy the Feast of Tabernacles. If it's with us here in New Orleans, we invite everybody. If you want to come to New Orleans, if we're here, come to New Orleans. But you need to pay attention to the website. We'll send out an email alert. And we'll keep you as, as uh, focused as possible upon the possible changes, because we only have two weeks. And we'll, you know what? We'll make it a great feast no matter where we are. But if you're in Florida, you want to stay in Florida and visit some of the other sites over there. you got Jim O'Brien's group, which is, you know, you know great people. Or there's others that are, that are in the area. By all means, you know, you need to feel free to, to serve your family and God at the Feast of Tabernacles. And uh, hopefully you'll spend some time with us or maybe visit the other sites. Uh, I can't think of anything else that, that I want to say besides that. Now, if you want to come here and you need help making arrangements, you know, call the church number, 504-367-2005. All right, we'll get back with you because we, we don't man the phone 24 hours a day, but we will be there every every hour or two, catching those, those calls and getting back in touch with you. We're looking at the hotels over here and making some arrangements. And they've been kind of empty for the most part, except for after Hurricane uh, Laura. They brought some evacuees over here. But I went online just quickly looking at yesterday, and they're dropping prices because they're not renting a lot because of COVID. There's not a lot of activities. There's no events. So I don't think we're going to have a trouble finding a room here because I could be wrong with that, but I don't think we will. Well, good afternoon again. Oh, we're filling up in the back. Great. Welcome, everyone. Um, and and uh, risk of sounding kind of corny, but didn't you notice I'm singing up a storm behind them? <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm going to preach a storm. All right. I want to welcome everyone to the Feast of Trumpets 2020. By the way, that's the title to the sermon. I put a lot of thought into that. It's never been used before in all the centuries. Never been a year, it seems like this in modern times, when you think about it. I was watching this morning, the, the weather is just like, it's, uh, there's an anger out there. You know, God says that all creation groans, you know, in travail. We're looking at it. We're looking at it across the nation. That they're talking about the fires out west, and it's the third right now, and they've still got a long way to go. They've already got over 7 million acres burnt this year. 
is the third largest in modern times. You know what the other two were? 2015, Blood Moon Tetrad year, and 2017. The time where it looked like it was the time of Revelation 12. Heavenly signs. There's too many coincidences going on to believe that this is all just, just happenstance and it means nothing. I want to talk about the trumpets today because this day pictures a day when finally, for you and I, this world, it's over. When Jesus Christ steps his foot on this planet, you and I are going to meet him in the air. And when we come back, we start a whole new job of rebuilding. That's why we're called. That's a part of your heritage. 1 Corinthians 15 says, In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the trump shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Is there anybody in your family or someone close to you that has died over the years that you'd like to see again? They've been in the church. It's coming. And it's going to happen. You need to believe that. We're going to go through a period of time that God calls a time of wearing down of the saints, the elect, a time of Jacob's trouble. But I'm going to talk about something today. I, I want to get to the other side. I don't want to talk about all the problems and the trauma and the, the calamity. I want to talk about something that's very important to you and I. It's your relationship to Jesus Christ to get to this day. All right, so let's go through this. Acts 1 says, And when they were therefore come together, and they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They looked in the physical plane. They, run, they wanted to know that when is finally we're going to be back to the Israel of time of old, the time when they were the greatness, when they were rulers of this world. They thought he was going to come back and he was going to do it at that time. And he said to them, it's not for you to know the time or the seasons. Now, I didn't see this, believe it or not. <laughs> Maybe you did. I didn't. I'm kind of slow. To know the time or the seasons, he tells them there. You realize what he just said? In Matthew 24, he says, you're going to know it by the seasons. Right? Talked about the fig tree. But he just told them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons. It wasn't in their time. You realize that? It wasn't for them to know. So things that we're learning today, things that God's going to reveal before his coming back, the church didn't know 50 years ago or 60 years ago. Why? Because it wasn't for them to know. It meant nothing to them. And how would they understand a nuclear blast back then? How would they understand what's going on today? They just wouldn't understand it. He says, which the Father has put into his own power. They wouldn't know the time or the seasons. But he says in Matthew 24, at the end time, you're going to know the seasons. And that's what's going to be able to give us the idea about what time it is he's coming back. He said, but you shall receive power. And that's what happened to them. It wasn't for them to know the seasons because it wasn't in their lifetime. But it was for them to receive the power because that was in their lifetime. So what you're going to learn and what we're going to learn over the next few years ahead before Jesus Christ returns is things that he's putting into your power and your understanding and your might. That's what we're working for. That's what we need to look at. And when I talked about today with the, with the feast, we're going to have a great feast. I don't know where it's going to be, but it's going to be a great feast wherever we are because we have the Spirit of God working in us. And we're going to make it the best feast we could ever make it. Why? Because we have Jesus Christ who promises that. When I look at a time, and I've lived here almost my whole life since I was two, I've been through over 30 storms, big ones and little ones. I've been through eyes of hurricanes. Well, I remember being up on the farm with Jeff. We went through an eye. When it got real calm, we went out on the property, started nailing tin and everything back down again so it wouldn't get blown away when it came back through the neck. Then you feel the wind pick back up, you run back inside again. I've been in a hurricane where I watched my roof lift off the side and water come rushing, flying in through the, between the walls and the ceiling into my, into my bedroom where I was hiding. And I went out and I watched gigantic pines, gigantic pines, snap, went right over the house I lived, went right over it. When I got up the next morning, I saw a path almost a half mile wide of trees down. And God protected my home. God promises you protection. He's going to give you all you need to get you where he wants you to be. 
And you need to remember that. No matter what you go through, no matter how tired or exasperated or angry you get. And frankly, I was upset yesterday. You know, I, you know, I wasn't expecting to have to move everything at the last minute. I know there's going to be a lot of disappointed people that look for this as their vacation time. We can only do what we're going to do. And then whatever God allows us to go through, we're going to make the best of it. And we're going to praise God and thank Him that we have the opportunity to do it. And that's what we're going to do. And he went on to say, and when he spoke these things, he beheld, and he was taken up into a cloud and received them out of his sight. And so there they were, all gathered together. They've been talking to Jesus Christ after the resurrection for 40 days. He said, now y'all wait right here because there's a promise coming. And I'm telling you, we need to wait right here because Jesus Christ tells us there's a promise coming in our day. It's called trumpets. That's his return. And like they went there waiting for him to go up, it never happened in his day, but it can happen in ours. So while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood up in white apparel. And he said, you men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing up in heaven? This same Jesus, which was taken up from you into heaven, shall come in like manner as you have seen him go to heaven. And so we look up. Remember when Peter says, when you see all these things happening, he says, look up because salvation draws near. So what are we looking up to? Salvation. Jesus Christ is our salvation. He'll be drawing near to you and I. And look what it says in Thessalonians when all that happens. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. What did the, the children of Israel do when they across the Jordan, and they stood on the side of the sea, and they looked at Jericho and all those walls and everything they had to do. What did God tell them to do? To walk around the walls, and eventually on the seventh trump, they were to shout, and the walls would come and fall down. And that's going to happen. That was the physical, the spiritual, that you and I are going to enter, because this world is going to collapse when Jesus Christ comes back. They think they're going to beat Jesus Christ. They're going to round up an army unlike any army that's ever been seen before, and they think they're going to fight Christ and defeat him. Nonsense. But they think they will. They think they have the power to do that. It says, with a shout and the voice of an archangel and with the trump of God. With the trump of God. God himself instead of going to blow the trump. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. The dead in Christ shall rise first. So that means all those people who have gone through this life who have held fast to the very end, who have accepted Jesus Christ as his, our Lord and Savior, who lives for Jesus Christ, will be resurrected. And will be with him, he says, Then we which are alive and remain. So that means to tell us that Paul, the Apostle Paul at that time, thought he was going to be alive at the return of Jesus Christ. And so it has been for 2,000 years, almost every generation, has thought it would be in their time. It's a merciful thing God does. What, would you, what do you think Paul would felt to go through everything he went through and say, well, no, Paul, it's not 2,000 years. There's no sense of urgency here. And how about the church of God today? Where's the sense of urgency, by the way? How can, how can the church not be shaken with what's all going on today? Think about that. We'll be arrived to meet him in the cloud. Now look at 1 Corinthians 14. Now, some of these slides I used for News Nuggets and Insights two weeks ago, so if you saw that, you'll see where I'm going through. But I want to be able to bring out something that's very important for you and I today. It says, even these things which uh, are life-giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinct sound, how shall it be known what is piped or harp? So when Jesus Christ called you and I to give a warning, an end-time message for the return of Jesus Christ, does this world understand what we're saying? Have we made it plain enough that they can hear it? even if they don't understand it, that they can hear it? For if the trump gives an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself for battle? When we look around, does God have your attention yet? In 2020, what's going on here? When we began in 2020, I'll be honest with you, in January, I was, I was kind of void. I said, like, I don't know where to go to now in our, in our sermon series. God has given us and blessed us with a timeline for seven years that pinpointed specific events brought in duality, pulled in the Old Testament, tied him into the New Testament, showed the physical, the spiritual, the former, and the latter. But in January, I was like, man, I didn't know what to preach. And so as I prayed about for guidance and direction, I said, well, the only thing I do know is that we're in a society in a time that seems like it's better than in modern times. 
But I know before Christ is going to be the worst time ever. So it had to be from now to then. We got to go from here to there. It's like, like that's a lot of change. But you know what happens like this. When I hear ministers in the church say, oh, we got a lot of things we got to go through yet. You got time. Oh, really? No kidding. How much time do you think we got? Put your finger on that. How much time do you think you got? How much time does it take to turn the world upside down? Well, it took about three months. And this world was totally upside down. And it hasn't stopped. And it's not going to stop. There'll be reprieve. There'll be quiet times. God's going to give you a chance to catch your breath to get ready for the next wave that's coming on. And they will come in waves. And with each wave, they will get closer, and they will get bigger, just like that of a hurricane. Because God says that in Luke. That is exactly the way it's going to happen, and you're witnessing it. And so here we sit in New Orleans, praying for protection if we had to move the, the, the Feast of Tabernacles here. But one more time, the fifth time this year, that, that a storm was pointed directly in New Orleans when it first got started. And again, we're watching being turned away. And it looks like there's a spiritual battle going on out there of one trying to wreck New Orleans and the other one trying to protect New Orleans. And, us, and so I believe that God is protecting us to get a word out and get a message out because we have an audience that God's been blessing us with to receive the word of God. And I, see, I receive positive feedback every single week. People thanking us for what we're saying and what we're doing. Now, I also get emails that people don't like what I'm saying and doing. You know, I try to put those aside and not dwell on those too much. So likewise, except that you utter by tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken, for you shall speak in the air? So unless we are clear and decisive for the word of God, what point is it what we're doing here? At the sound of the trump, God says, so what I put up here, this is from, uh, I believe this was, uh, you did this one in the Day of the Lord series. But what, uh, what this is, is the book of Revelation. All right, so I'm not going to spend the time here, but I wanted to show you. You had the seven seals that you go through the books. Then you have the seven trumps. And with the seventh trump, they have the seven last plagues. With the plagues, they have the woes. All of those things have to happen before Christ comes back. Of course, he can cut time short. So when we get to this day, is the seventh trump. At the final trump, God blows the trump. And it's time for Jesus Christ to come back. That's what this day pictures, the return of Jesus Christ. So here they are laid out. Laid out in, and this is not a timeline series sermon, by the way. I'm just using this as reference to, to get to where we're at. So here's the, here's the seals of what we're looking at. In the seals, it gives us. False Christ. People say, well, we've always had false Christ. Yes, but they're getting worse. And you're going to have a big false Christ coming. In fact, the day after the Feast of Tabernacles begins this year, he will sit in Rome and he will begin to re educate this entire world. And they're going after God's people. That's where it's going to. And there'll be wars and famine and pestilence. But God says he'll keep you from the pestilence. Then you have the persecution of the elect. The heavenly signs, seven trumps, the three woes, and eventually Christ's return. We've got to go through all of that. So if someone tells you, oh, we've got plenty of time, please understand there's no time frame given here, except in a couple of occasions. They'll see like for a year and a month or the three and a half years for the tribulation. So at any given time, all of this can happen in a matter of weeks and years for all this to finally be concluded. God says at the end time, he's going to make a short work. Don't forget that. A short work before he comes back. He's not going to let this world suffer through decade and decade and decade of this kind of trauma. He's going to bring it to an end for you. He said, if not for the elect's sake, no flesh would be saved. Because of what Jesus Christ did, who lived and died for you, giving you an opportunity to be a part of his return and the re-education to this planet, he's going to make it short. He said, if it wasn't for you, no flesh would be saved. He had done it for nothing. So we went through Revelation. We talked about how Revelation began, when I still believe that now more than ever, that it shows the book of Revelation begins in, for, in Revelation 1.10, and it goes all the way through the day of the Lord to Revelation 22. So the day of the Lord well, we, was taught that it begins at the end of the seventh seal. I believe what the Bible tells me. 
that John, at the very beginning, was at the day of the Lord, Revelation 1.10. Christ eventually returns on the seventh trump. So all of these things are taking place. In part, those things are happening right now. You need to understand some of that. Whether it is the full seal, I don't know. We will look back and we will know. But they're happening, it looks like it could be some of that right now is what we're looking at. So 2014, 15, I talked about the fires. I talked about the problems, the calamities going on. 2014, 15, what happened is what the people on this planet says, oh, that's nothing. Really? Maybe it was a warning sign. So then we go all the way through to 2020, where we are to this year. If we went back three and a half years, what did we find? Did anything happen three and a half years ago that sounds familiar, or vaguely reminiscent of the Bible? Well, 2017. Heavenly signs in Revelation 12 lines up perfectly with the end time Christ return to the first time Christ. We see the almost identical signs except for the one planet that was in the womb for nine months in that heavenly sign. We talked about all of that in the day of the Lord revisited in Joel. So here we are, Joshua 1 verse 11. Prepare you victuals, Joshua tells them, or God tells Joshua, for within three days you shall pass over this Jordan to go in to possess the land. So I ask you today, where do we stand on the edge of eternity? Edge looking at possibly the Jericho and the spiritual realm. If I'd have told you in 2017 that in three years, three days, days a year, that the world would begin to go to hell in a handbasket, as they used to call it, would anybody have believed that? Well, I didn't understand it back then, but we can look at it now. 2020, the decade of change is where we're at. Are we looking at the beginning of the seals? Well, time will tell us what we're looking at. So what we're looking at going ahead, and you need to mean to put this in your mind, when you get irritated or you get inconvenienced, or you don't like the way this world's treating you, this is what you're going through. Unless you die before then, and Jesus Christ allows you to sleep till he comes back, you need to get your head wrapped around what's coming. You need to get ready to be inconvenienced, to have some tough times. It's time that you and I need to toughen up about what's coming and get ready and not think about ourselves, but the work that he has called us to do. And that's for every one of us. That's just not me, but that's all of us. All of us have part in the return of Jesus Christ. Now, there is a person who's sounding the trump. They're sounding the warning. Is it a certain trump that everybody can understand? This is the Feast of Trumps. We'll talk about the different Trumps in just a minute. It's going to begin on Friday night and Saturday, September 25th and 26th. And believe me, there needs to be a revival. There is no doubt there needs to be a revival, a time of repentance. I'm going to play the short version of this from Jonathan Kahn. It's a little over three minutes, and I'm going to come back and talk about this in just a second. We got that ready? Let's go ahead and play that. This is Jonathan Kahn. We are standing at a pivotal moment in American history and world history, a moment that can permanently seal our nation's course and the course of the world for good, for bad, for calamity, for redemption. America and much of Western civilization was founded on a biblical foundation stone, but it's turned away from that foundation. We have not only driven God out of our public life and have called what is good evil and what is sin good, but we have sacrificed the lives of over 60 million unborn children. And America's fall from God is not only progressing, it's accelerating to the point that it's no longer just a falling away, but a war against the purposes of God. I wrote in the Harbinger of the signs of judgment that appeared in the last days of ancient Israel, warning of calamity, and that these same signs of warning have now appeared on American soil. The biblical template concerning judgment is that the nation so warned is given a space of time to return or to head for judgment and calamity. We are now in that window of time. But if America continues on its present course, that window will come to an end and there will come a flood that will begin the end of religious freedom, even usher in persecution and seal America's fall. And if America falls, it will affect the entire world. This year, 2020, is crucial as it leads to a presidential election in which the stakes are higher and the necessity of prayer more critical than ever before.
and even if the election goes in the direction of biblical values and righteousness, if we don't see a spiritual turning, an awakening, a repentance, revival, then all the political, legal, judicial, and cultural efforts will ultimately fail or be undone. We have a window of time, and the purpose of that window is to return and for revival. Without that return, America will be lost. What can we do? What can you do? In the days following 9-11, people flocked to houses of worship, and it looked as if there could have been a spiritual revival and awakening, but it never came because there was no repentance. And without repentance, without a turning back, there can be no revival. But I have seen once in my life, the hand of God changed the course of American and world history. And it all began, not in the halls of government, but with the people of God who gathered in a sacred assembly in our nation's capital with the scripture, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their sinful ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. It can happen again. But if we don't respond now, at this most critical moment, we may never have the chance to do so again. It's time to break up our fallow ground. It's time to seek the Lord as never before. It's time to return. And no doubt what he said is true. This nation needs to turn to God. But the problem is they don't know what to turn from. And there's where I, I, have, a, I have a real issue. We had a chance to meet Jonathan Kahn when we did our, uh, one of our very first specials. Incredible individual. Very humble. One of the hardest working people we've met. In fact, when we met, we spent the whole day with him. He had nothing to eat, and we didn't stop for eating either. And then, then uh, Audrey and George and I believe, made some had food that they had brought that we picked up and brought them. We all just sat around the table, just sat there and ate and talked. He's a terrific guy. I wrote to him recently, a couple months ago, and I asked him, I said, there's certain repentance that's not being addressed here, and that was on the sin of homosexuality. And I, and I told him in a letter, I won't take time to read it now because I've got other things I want to focus on, that unless that's addressed first, then, the, then this revival is dead on arrival. You can't ask God to forgive and heal a nation if you don't repent of the sins that's bringing the nation down. And that's only the beginning. And the other issue is that everyone who out there is going to continue to keep the pagan practice of Christmas and Easter and Sunday worship. So here's what they got on the, re the return. There is the return. It begins on, it'll be done on Saturday. It actually begins on Friday night. He says, Son of man, I have set you a watchman to the house of Israel. Therefore, you shall hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. Unless the people understand what sin is and how to repent of it, there is no repentance for sins. He just said so. I never heard back. I don't know that I was going to hear back. I may not even remember who I was. It was five years ago that we met and spent that time together. But here's what I'm looking at from God's holy word, from the trumpet we're sounding. The warning that's going out, it is an unclear, is it clear the warning of the repentance? Are they being told what to repent of? So here we have on, on Friday night, which begins the Sabbath day, they begin their activities for their revival. And I'm sure there'll be some worship in all of this, but there's so much activity going on. It is being done on the Sabbath day rather than the Sunday. So as they do this, they will have their revival on the Sabbath day, which should be the day of rest. But you would put a revival on Sunday. All the activity and work and the food and all the work that's got to be done into that. But here what happens is that we use the Sabbath to do the repentance portion of it. They will go to church on Sunday and back to work on Monday. Here's my issue. That Monday is the most sacred day of the year. It's called the Day of Atonement. Not a word is being said about this. And so here we have is that even in the repentance, in the, the integrity of the repentance, I give them that. And in fact, the people who are going there, I believe, are seeking God with all their heart. They can look at what's going around this world, what's going on, just like you and I can. And I'm hoping 
that this revival, even if they don't get it here, that God will put that seed in their heart so that when it comes to the time that the innumerable multitude are called to repentance, there will be a seed that will glow and it will ride up. And they will listen to the true word of God the way God intended it to be from Jesus Christ's own lips. So they have Sunday worship, and then eventually it goes right to tabernacles, and again, no mention of tabernacles. How do you repent of something you know nothing about? And that's what they're looking at there. And here's what's really interesting. So here we are in the fall holy days, in the middle of the, one of the worst seasons ever been with the hurricanes, fires out of control, across the derecho in the middle of the country, you know, wars going on in the Middle East, they got the COVID taking place, wrapped around God's holy days is a supposed revival that, that I believe God will hear some because God looks at the heart and the intention. I don't know the intent of these people's hearts. I only wish that it goes, that they come to the truth. And then when they get to the tabernacles, when it's over, guess who begins his campaign? The Pope in Rome, the very day after the Feast of Tabernacles concludes, he begins. So Satan is wrapped around everyone, trying to deceive, confuse, and send out trumpets that are unclear as to what's going on. But unless these people come to repentance of sin, and what is sin? Sin is the transgression of the law. Then God won't hear. That's what's going on. The Bible gives us two types of trumpets. There's a silver and a ram's horn. All right, this, the, uh, the silver trumpet is called the, uh, the Hasazar, and then you have the shofar, uh, which is what most people understand and re recognize as the shofar. Each trumpet had a specific sound for ancient Israel. In Numbers 10, it spends most of the time talking about the silver horns. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Make to you two trumpets of silver. Of a whole piece of silver you shall make them, and you shall use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journeying of the camps. So as they would go to camp, they would blow the horn. From the sound of the horn, they know exactly what they're supposed to do. And when they shall blow them, plural, the assembly shall assemble themselves at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. But if they blow them with one trump, then the princes, which are the heads of the house, the thousands of Israel, shall gather themselves. So they had a system in order to understand that when the sound went out and the trump went out, they knew what they were supposed to do and where they were supposed to go. At this assembly that's going to take place in Washington, there will be a sound will go out. I pray that they'll talk about the sin of the homosexuality and what's going on. Because this is one of the big things that Jesus Christ said is going to be in taking this entire world before he returns. It will be like Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, people are talking about it, and even in that video, if you went to listen to the whole thing, they talk about abortion. Nothing is being said of homosexuality. And if you speak out against it, it's almost as if you have just marked yourself for death. So nobody really wants to talk about it. There are a few churches out there that are doing that. But unless that's addressed, it doesn't have a chance for repentance. You've got to understand that. I don't care how sincere the heart is. God's going to say, listen, you're sincerely wrong. You know, you knew better. Says, when you blow the alarm a second time, the camps that lie on the south shall take their journey, and they shall blow the alarm for their journeys. When the congregation to be gathered together, you shall blow, but you shall not sound the alarm. So there's even different types of sounds that would blow with the same type of systems. In Exodus 19, this is the beginning where you begin to hear about the trumps for the first time. In Exodus 19, verse 13, it says, there shall not a hand of it, but for he shall surely be stoned or shot, talking about coming near the foot of the mountain. You can't talk to God and bring, go to God any way you want to. You have to, be, you have to be invited to be a part of that. You cannot approach God on your terms. You've got to understand that. It's got to be on the terms that Jesus Christ gave you. It goes on, it says, Whether beast or man, you shall not live. But when the trumpet shall sound long, then you shall come up to the mount. The word trumpet there is called Jobel. It's a ram's horn which with a continuous blast. All right? it's, it's a totally different, a different sound. It says, and when you shall come to pass on the third day. It's interesting how often the Bible talks about being ready on the third day. Go through that and start marking that. Jesus Christ, three days in the, in the ground. When he talked about coming up to the mountain, be ready in three days. When he talked to Joshua, getting ready to cross the Jordan, be ready in three days. 
Interesting how God brings those things out to us. It says, And when it came on the third day in the morning, there was thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain, and the voice of a trumpet exceedingly loud, so that all the people in the camp trembled. That trumpet's called the shofar. Now, what's quite interesting is when the trump would sound to bring them to God, you couldn't use a man-made instrument. It had to be something that God created. It was the ram's horn. It was the shofar. So in other words, if you're going to approach God, you can't approach God on your terms. There's nothing you can build, nothing you can put together, nothing you can design that's going to reach God. God says, you're going to come to me. You're going to come to me on my terms. Even when they built the, uh, the uh, sacrificial areas, they said, you can't use huge stone. You have to use natural stone. You said, no, you can only use what I give you for me. That's his. The shofar is used in verse 19 and then also in 20. So when this particular time it's used as the shofar, by the way, it's also used on uh, Jubilee. It's always used on Jubilee. Why? Because the Jubilee pictures a time coming of the new heaven and new earth. A time coming of freedom, a time of the Father coming back to this earth. The completion of 50 at the end time. Leviticus 23, verse 24, it says this, Speak to the children of Israel and say, In the twelfth day and the first day of the month you shall have a Sabbath. By the way, that is today. We are keeping that day right here today. And it is on a Sabbath day, by the way. So you shall have a holy Sabbath, which is an annual Sabbath, and is also is on this Sabbath day today. A memorial of the blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. Speak to the children of Israel, say, in the seventh month, the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath. A memorial blowing of trumpets. Now, why did I say that twice? I just repeated the same thing. Sounds sounds silly, huh? Because what's interesting here is this. This is the translation, as we understood it from King James, a memorial of the blowing of trumpets. However, the word you here is not, there's no trumpet mentioned. It's a memorial of the day of blowing, which is the correct translation. There, the trumpet is 8643, it's teruah, which means an acclamation of joy and a cry out of war. So it is a memorial of blowing. So neither of the trumpets was used that was used for the shofar or the silver horn. So here is a memorial of blowing, is what it should be read. Why? Because it encompasses all the trumpets at the time. All right, so just a little point aside in case you, you were interested in, in looking up the, some scriptures. So now, let's go on. Joshua 3. So it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host, and they commanded the people, saying that when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord coming, and the priest bears it, you shall remove it from your place and go after it, Come not near to it, that you may know by which way you must go, for you have not passed this way before. And so we have in type the very spiritual principle where you stand today waiting for the return of Jesus Christ to come back. We have never passed this way before. We don't know what's going to come tomorrow. We're not promised tomorrow. We know if we have to follow Jesus Christ and follow him to where we're going because we haven't been this way before. When they stood there, when they crossed the Jordan, the, the, the type, the analogies, the, the visuals that you can pull from this is, is beyond belief because they stood on the edge of eternity. And in their sight, looking at the distance, they could see Jericho. And they knew they have to, they have to destroy that city if they were ever going to go into the promised land. Just like today, when we face and we're looking at that promised land coming. When Jesus Christ comes back, he's going to have to defeat this world. To be able to be able to go into the kingdom, to be able to begin to reestablish and resettle this planet the way God intended it to be from the beginning. So here we have, they're standing on the promised land. What are they looking at? They're looking at Jericho. What are you looking at today? When you look ahead, are you, are you looking at calamity? Are you looking at promise? Are you looking at just all the things going on in the world? Or when you look ahead and you see all that, do you take the time? To look up and realize that salvation is drawing near. You need to embrace what's coming with the certainty of the protection of Jesus Christ or you're not going to make it. You can't do this on your own. I don't care how strong you think you are, you will not make it on your own. Israel could see Jericho from the Jordan. 
And in their minds, they sat around talking to their children, like their parents did to them, telling the stories when they first came out of Egypt. And so for 40 years, they had to live with their parents' sin of going back to Egypt, where God says, you're not going to go into the promised land. Your children's going to go. So they lived with those stories in their minds for 40 years, but now they're on the other side. And they can see Jericho. And he sent two spies out. Interesting how you send two spies out. That's what God's going to do. They're called the two witnesses at the end time. And they're going to go out there and going to tell this world what's wrong with it. And the world's going to hate them. And eventually they're going to kill them. And they're going to lay in the street for three and a half days, or three days and three nights. And they're going to be resurrected. So we may not know the day or the year when Jesus Christ comes back now, but when we see the men laying in the street, you're going to know we got three days. And Christ is coming back. So what do you see when you look ahead now? Fear? You want to hide? Or do you want to look forward and go forward with all the power and the protection of Jesus Christ? Numbers 27 says that God even brought Moses to Mount Nebo because he couldn't go in because he sinned. What's interesting is that this is a friend of God. God wouldn't let him go in. He made one mistake. One mistake. Couldn't go in. Because you see, in type, he was Jesus Christ. In type, he was like the Savior bringing them out of sin to the promised land. And so Jesus Christ, every time he would walk this earth when he was tempted, or he might look back remembering what he had to do to Moses because Moses didn't go in, knowing that if he sinned just one time, he wasn't going to be our Savior. So he had to live perfectly his entire life. He had to die perfectly on the stake, alone, by himself. And he did it for you. This is what the children of Jericho looked at. A wall, a mountain, is unsurmountable. And what did they have? They didn't have anything, basically, to go in to do that. They had the truth of God. Give you an idea of the size of the walls that they had to go around to, 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 to address. It was a double set of walls. They had now get past the first breach. They had to get into a second breach before they could get into that city. It was the most powerful city of its time. And they had to go defeat those people when they went through. But they had to do it the way God says. And here's just an order rendition of what the walls looked like and was falling down. You can imagine what the children of Israel would thought when they saw that. So in Joshua 6, the instructions were to bring down Jericho. The Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men, to march around the city once with all the armed men. You shall do this for six days and have seven priests carry seven trumpets. How many trumps at the end time in the book of Revelation? Seven. Seven. And on the seventh day, they marched around the city seven times. And in the seventh trump, how many, how many sounds after that? Seven. After that? Seven, seven, seven. So when you hear the long brass blast of the trumpets, the whole army will give a shout, and then the wall of the city will collapse, and the army will go up, everyone straight in. So there we have the picture I just showed you a little while ago. So what do you think the children, I mean the people in the Jericho thought? They might have been terrified at first. It said they were. But what happens when you see the children of Israel? They simply just walk around the building, don't say a word. Everybody's really quiet. And they go home. They must say, well, these are nutty Israelites down there. And they see them come back the next day. And they had to be silent. And they walked around again. Then what? And third day. By that time, they're probably laughing at them, watching them walk around the building, trying to figure, what in the world are we gonna, these people doing out there? Until the seventh time and the seventh day. Seven times around the city. And eventually they all blow and the walls fall down and they go in. So here you have the seven priests carrying the seven ram's horns. And here you have with, the, with Revelation, the seventh day and it's marched around the city seven times. And there you have the seven last plagues. All right. And then you have, when you hear the sound of a long blast on the trumpets and the whole army shall give a loud shout, the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go in and straight, everyone is straight in. And so that's what we're looking at in Revelation. Let me bring this out. I've showed you this before, so I'm going to bring it out again. So put these up there. So now let's see, let's compare this into Revelation and what God did with the children of Israel for you and I to see today. When you hear the sound of a long blast of the trumpets, look what Revelation says. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven. A long blast going on at the same time. It says, and the whole army shall give a shout. 
All right, so this is more than one. And there were voices, God says, and thunders and lightnings. The whole army, it says in Jeremiah. And here we have, and the wall of the city will collapse. Again. Um, hey, I don't even have a power cord in here. Hang on a second. We're going off of home and human energy. But I'm running out of steam. So you, Paul, didn't have to go through all of this. All right, here we go. All right, I'm back. It's a miracle. <laughs> all right, the city and the walls will collapse, it says. And look at Revelation. And there was a great earthquake. Such was not since the men were on the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. It, I don't know how you feel about this. God did this thousands and thousands of years ago, and we're talking about revelation, what's going to happen. Isn't that amazing? When those people resurrected, and you get a chance to talk to them, he says, come here, let me, let me show you what you guys did. You had no idea what that meant. Because they didn't know what that meant at the time. You look at your calling sometimes, you say, yeah, I don't know what God's called me. You will. You will. Hang in there. God will show you specific. And how about this one? And the army will go up, everyone, straight in. And here it says in Revelation, and the great city divided, three parts, and the city of the nations fell. Great Babylon came to remembrance before God. God told Joshua, I have given you the city, and he has told you and I, he has given us this world. We don't need to be fearful. We need to be bold in the power of Jesus Christ. Look what Peter says. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you be in all holy conversation in godliness? Is that where God finds you today? In your conversations, when you're away from God's people, are you holiness in all conversation and godliness? How do you live the rest of your life? The other seven, six days of the week when you're not here on a Sabbath day. Or you found the same then as you are today. Now, I'm going to show you something here that I never put these two connections together, but I think it's important here for what we're talking about. Make sure I got the time. God talks about the love of the truth in 2 Thessalonians. You know where I'm going. And you know what it says. He says, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Now, I've always looked at that, and our church has always took, looked at it in a certain way, talking about doctrine and you know, the, the truth and the things we've learned. And it's true. You do do that. It's, God says, and for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And we usually refer to that people who knew the truth once, once and they turn away from it, and they start believing something that was never taught. And God says, listen, because you didn't have a love of the truth, the information, the knowledge, the understanding, the insight that God gives you, God's going to send you a delusion. And I will tell you something. I've seen people been so delusional, I don't care what I tried to do, they will not believe what you got to say. And dawned on me one day, finally, God sent them a delusion. There's nothing I can do to change that. Until God changes it in their mind, they come to repentance to see the truth again, a person who's been given a delusion by God himself, you can't change. You can try to you're blue in the face. Going on, that they might be all be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, normally when you read this scripture, you think of beliefs and doctrine, don't you? And it's true, you do. But I'm going to show you something else that's even more important. John 14, 6 says, Jesus said, I am the way the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Because they had not a love of Jesus Christ. You follow me? He is the truth. It's not what you do, it's what you believe. It's who you believe, which is Jesus Christ. If you do not have the love of Jesus Christ, you're not going to make it. That's where it begins. 
It's from this love of Jesus Christ that gives you the strength to have the love of the doctrine. You realize that? When I was a young man just coming into the truth and I was trying to learn things, my dad's favorite phrase was, get to know Jesus Christ. I said, well, I understand Jesus Christ. And he said, no, no, get to know him. You need to get to know Jesus Christ. You need to understand him, his personality, his makeup, his love, his desire to be with you. That's what you got to, that's the truth that we need to have. Because you see, when things go down really, really, really poorly, if Jesus Christ has allowed you to be one of those marked for martyrdom, you'll have no doubt when that comes, you still have Jesus Christ with you. There'll never be a time, if you know your love of Jesus Christ, that you'll be in doubt, no matter what happens to you. But if you're only doing this, you're thinking you're doing it on your own power because you're keeping doctrine. You're keeping scripture. It can't be that way. What you have to be is, is under the, the, uh, the love and the umbrella of your elder brother, Jesus Christ. That love is the most important thing in your life. Without that, you're not going to make it. Revelation 2, verses 1 through 8 says this, Return to your first love. Let me show you something. I was reading this this morning. Audrey and I was talking about this uh, this morning in Revelation. Listen to what God says to this church. To the angel of the church of Ephesus said these words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden uh, lampstands. I know, this is Jesus Christ, the angel to the churches. I know your deeds, your hard work, I think I, this, I think I, NIV, I put this a little easier to, to read. Your perseverance. Here's a church that's working hard. They had deeds. They had fruits. They had perseverance. He says, I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people. They have separated them who, who are evil, in that you have tried those who claim to be apostles. They checked out those who are liars in the church that were not and were found to be false. Listen to verse 3. You have persevered. And you have endured hardships, hardships for my name, and you have not grown weary. I mean, what an exemplary record of any church, right? Then God says, but I have something against you. You for, you've forsaken the love you had at the beginning. You forgot your first love, God says. What is your first love? Is it the love of doctrine or is it the love of Jesus Christ? See what I mean? You can do all the works in the world, but if you don't love Jesus Christ and you haven't cozied him up as your brother, waiting to see your father, you missed the boat. You see that? And, I, and when I was talking to Audrey about some of this, I don't know if I put this in here in Revelation or not. No, I didn't put it in, I don't think. I always read the scripture where it says, didn't we you know, cast out demons in your name. Didn't we do all this in your name? And Jesus says, get away from me, I didn't know you. I always looked at that, is that those are people in the world who didn't know the truth. I'm a little slow. Audrey says, no, I never believe it that way. She says, I'm talking about the people in the church, people who knew the truth. Well, so what happened? They're doing all these things, but they didn't have the love of Jesus Christ. So I'm telling you, if you haven't recently, you need to go home, get on your knees, and begin to build a relationship with your brother. Get to know Jesus Christ. You can have all the timelines in the world, like God's been blessing us to be able to share. We can have all the knowledge of the understanding of the duality of times and events. But until you get to this point, that you accept Jesus Christ as your brother and willing to go through whatever it is he has for you, you miss the boat. This day pictures the time that Jesus Christ finally, after 2,000 years, after he's came, gave his life up, risked everything he ever had with the Father, that he gets to come back and be with you. That's what we need to focus on. That's where we're going. Look in Timothy, he says, but refuse profane and old wives' tales, and exercise yourself rather to godliness. Now, how do you do that? How do you exercise unto godliness? I know physical, 
I know mean, you got to go to the gym, you got to work out. You know, you go to the gym, you get in really good shape, but if you stop going for about a week or so and you go back, you, all of a sudden your muscles are already in atrophy? How about your prayer life? How about your relationship? Take time to get to know him as a friend. You know, when I, when I wrote this thing down, I had some, I've always wanted to be, somehow I'd like to be in this category. It's like, like Daniel, he was greatly beloved, God said. Wouldn't you like to know that God's of you? You know, or how about, how about Moses? He was a friend of God. They could walk by the tent when God's cloud was by there, and they can be on the outside of the tent. They can hear him talking inside with friend to friend. What an amazing story that is. You know, and then you got Abraham, and of course, David, a man after God's own heart. You know, so you need to exercise your relationship to Jesus Christ. Because that's who's coming back that we're going to be with. Bodily exercise profits little, but godly exercise profitable unto all things, having promise of life that is now and that which is to come. Paul instructed Timothy was for us to toughen up in our calling. That's what he's telling us to do. He says, listen, you need to exercise. You need to get in shape. You need to toughen up, get ready for what's going on. So we need to be tough-minded. Right? So in the years ahead, I'm telling you, we need to be tough-minded on the kingdom. God tells us to let no man take our crown. How many times have we often used that? But are you exercising your relationship to keep it? 2 Peter 3 says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwells righteousness. All right? Wherefore, beloved, seeing that we look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace, without spot and without blameless. Now, I'm showing you something here. Many times in the Bible, when God talks about looking to his return, it pulls in our godliness. Look what it says here. Wherefore, be loved, seeing that you look to such things, to the future, we're to be diligent in peace, without spot and blameless. In other words, when you're looking there, you have to be exercising to be this way to get there. If you're going to run a marathon, whatever those miles might be, you've got to be in shape and you're not going to make it there. So God's saying, if you're going to get here, you need to be here. That means you need to be here now to do that. Over and over in the Bible connects godliness and holiness and purity to the return of Christ. But it's talking about this inside of you to the return. Let's show you. Here's one. 1 Corinthians 1, 7 and 8. So that when you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that you may be blameless at the day of the Lord. The coming of our Lord, that you are blameless in the day of the Lord of Jesus Christ. You see the connection? Christ is coming. He's going to have to find you blameless. How do you get there? You exercise your spiritual relationship with him. Hebrews 4, 12, 14 says, Follow peace with all men and holiness, and without no man can see the Lord. So unless you have holiness, how, do you have, how can you have holiness? If the Spirit of God isn't in you, there is no holiness. The only thing can make anything holy is God. So if you're holy, that means His Spirit has to be in you. All right? Go on to Colossians. It says, for you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. So when Christ, who is our Lord, shall appear, then you shall also appear him in glory. All right, so talking about Christ coming, you're going to be with him in glory. See the connection? The Bible is filled with stuff like this. Unless you look for it, you don't see it. How about three? First John 2, verse 28. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, talking about appearing, that you may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming, right? So we, have, so we have to have confidence and not be ashamed of Jesus Christ, right? Let's do a couple more. 1 Thessalonians 3, 12 and 13. The Lord says, make you to increase and abound in love toward one another, toward another, and toward all men, even as you do toward you, and to the end that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness, before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with his saints. There we are. 
establishing us unblameable in holiness when? At the coming with Jesus Christ. See the connection? All right, here's another one. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. You see how often God talks? Connects them. He says, yeah, you want to be there? Well, God says, if you're going to be there, this is where you got to be. And you start now. You start today. You make sure that God is in you, the Spirit of God dwells in you, that you're thankful for all things, whether it's hurricanes coming, or you're not going to be in Florida if we, if we don't get that worked out for the feast. You're going to have to be in old rotten New Orleans. <laughs> I was told by a minister the other day, well, it's easy for y'all. You already live there. Well, wait a minute. The people who live here want to go somewhere else. They don't want to be here. <laughs> So you got that backwards. <laughs> you got that backwards. All right, so here we go. Back to that business. All right, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23. In the very God of peace, sanctify you wholly, and I pray your God and whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here we are being preserved blameless when? At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. See the connections? All right, let's do one more. All right, one more. 1 John 2, 3, verse 2 and 3. Beloved, now we are, we, now are we the sons of God. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but, what, but we know that when he shall appear, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. When is that? When he shall appear, we shall be purified even as he is pure. So every time we see this without recognizing it, so we read it and we read right past it. Well, so every time it talks about the coming of our Lord, Jesus Christ says you can't have him any way. It has to be this way. That means you need to toughen up now. You need to purify yourself now. You have to have the Spirit of God in you. You have to have the love of the truth, Jesus Christ. Not the love of the doctrine of the truth. Not the love of doing what's right for the truth. But if you love Jesus Christ, you will do what is right. And nothing will be so hard that you have to sacrifice. You realize when you accept Jesus Christ like that, everything in your will and everything in your power, your mindset, it changes. Everything you think you had to have, it don't mean anything anymore. It's like, you know, you used to think like, I need to have all this kind of stuff. Like we've got so much stuff, you can't go to the feast, we've got to get a trailer and a bigger trailer and two wheels on a trailer because we've got stuff we're bringing. You've got to go find that sermon again, stuff. We did a sermon a couple years ago called Stuff. All right. We need to be tough-minded on your purpose, too. Not only just tough-minded on the kingdom, but you need to be tough-minded on your purpose. 2 Peter 3 says this, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that, the, that you look for such things, be diligent. You can't take your calling nonchalantly. You can't just come on Saturday and go back the rest of the week and, and live a life that's immoral, undecent, not talk to God till the next week, haven't opened your Bible up since the last Sabbath service. You need to be diligent, God says, that you may be found in him without spot and blameless. There it is again. And so 2 Peter 15, uh, 1 verse 5 says, and besides this, giving all diligence. I mean, you've got to work at this. You know why? Because Satan doesn't want you to make it. He does not want you to make it into the kingdom. He knows the scripture better than you and I. And he knows, it says, that if not for the elect, no flesh would be saved. His only opportunity of destroying the plan of God is destroying you. And God says that ain't going to happen. See, because God says that the church will always be here. That church is the spiritual ecclesia, which is Jesus Christ. It's not a body or an organization. It is the body of Jesus Christ, which is his church. 2 Peter 1.10 Wherefore, rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. You know, when you talk to your family members and they don't understand yet, it's okay. Keep praying for them because, see, God has to give them an open mind. You know, we had a prayer request for a person's son to be walking in the, 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 the rightness and righteousness of God. They have to have a calling. God has to open their minds for them to understand. He's blinded the rest of the world so they wouldn't know in this time, at this life, so he wouldn't have to destroy them. So he blinds most of the world, and he will open their mind if they can, can change their heart to follow him. Do you realize if God answered every one of our prayers for all our families, and they all learned the truth just like that, 
That'd make you really happy, wouldn't it? Until you find that their heart wouldn't change with the mind. And then they would live in sin, and God would have to destroy them. How would you feel then? What I'm saying is this, you need to trust God. If God didn't open their mind in this life, he will open them into the second coming at the end of the millennial reign. They're going to give them a chance, but God's going to give them the best shot they're going to get at the time when it's right for them, not when it's right for us. So until then, we do what we're supposed to do to be that example and pray that it's in this life before of the first resurrection. Philippians 3, brethren, I count not myself as apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth to those things which are before. I press. See, Paul uses words that's, that's hard, that's like a guy's working out in a gym, pushing, one more rep, one more rep, a little further, you can do this, go a little bit further. That's what God's going to do, getting us ready, tough-minded for what's coming. Because God knows better than you and I. It's hard to recognize what's going to go on around the world. When you see what's going on in the hurricane, when, when I'd say the place was, two, was 16 inches of water in the first floor, and somebody says, why can't they get that ready in two weeks? they got two whole weeks. You've never seen that yet, have you? People who say that don't understand what it takes. People here in New Orleans have been through it. You've got to get a little bit of an idea. The sand, the mud, and everything else, the smell. You know, you, you got to knock out sheetrock. You got to change insulation. Sometimes you got to change all the wirings. You got to have inspections. You got to spray for mold. You got two whole weeks. What's taking you? <laughs> like, what? I just wait. Let me just say this. You don't understand. Let me just say it. You don't understand. I got two weeks. You got two weeks. <laughs> so where I'm at? I'm right back to where we started. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trump shall sound. The dead shall be raised incorruptible. And if anyone's lost a loved one in a church, in the truth, that's your day. You're going to catch them on the way up. Give each other a hug. You won't even have to wear a mask for COVID. <laughs> and we're going to meet Jesus Christ in the air. Why? Because Jesus Christ has toughened you up. He's put in your heart what's important. You balance what's right and what's wrong. You made your choices, and you have chose to follow him. And when this happens, it will be on the Feast of Trumpets. What year? I don't know. But God willing, you and I will be there when it happens. And we who are alive shall be changed. I hope you have a great feast. Pay attention for all the changes that's coming for the feast over in Florida. And we'll keep everybody posted. And thanks again for tuning in, and we'll do everything in our power to serve all those that God's been given us to take care of God's holy word. Till next time.